a team of researchers as far away from civilization as they could be, stumbling onto something they couldn't prepare for. A threat capable of assimilating and imitating life. So deadly and prolific that if it were to reach the mainland, mankind as we know it would be wiped out with no one to trust and nowhere to run. The crew falls apart, fighting off a seemingly impossible threat while succumbing to paranoia. How long were you alone with that dog? What if we're wrong about him? Why then we're wrong? Making difficult choices in the heat of the moment. Which makes you a murderer, don't it? Palmer now. Two survivors are left in the dark and cold waiting to die, unsure of whether or not they can even trust each other in those final moments. One of the best horror films ever made, inspired by one of the best horror settings ever conceived. 20 years later, the movie now has a cult following, and a game is made. A sequel that places you into the heart of it, with features designed to make it feel just like the movie. Paranoia was set in, as you're unsure of who you can trust as you struggle to make them trust you. Wait a minute. Don't you come any closer. Where the hell did you come from anyway? There's a medical kit near the kennel. You go get it and come back here, and I'll watch you do the test. And just when you need them the most, your team can turn on you. How long was he infected? Is anybody else? 2002's The Thing video game was a success at launch, but quickly fell into obscurity. And today, we're going to ask the question, could it be one of gaming's most innovative hidden gems? It says survival horror. It says it on the box. Survival horror, right? What the fuck is going on here? As it turns out, the thing wound up being one of the worst games I've ever played. And it's not a survival horror game at all, despite what it might say in the box. It's an action adventure experience, so much so that it was nominated as the year's best action adventure title on release. Mixing action and horror has produced a lot of amazing games in the past. And on this very channel, we've covered games that find ways to combine two genres that shouldn't work into a product that actually does. The problem is, I can't actually think of a worse setting for an action-adventure experience. The thing works because the creature and the setting lend themselves to an oppressive, isolated, localized experience, aka the opposite of an adventure. Most of the tension comes from the erosion of trust and the paranoia. In the movie, the two possible survivors are still basically just waiting to freeze to death. It's meant to be bleak and hopeless not a problem that can be overcome with action one-liners and extra bullets. It's so efficient, the story for the movie is literally just a research team encounters an alien. That's it. Everything else is them dealing with that encounter. It doesn't and really can't accommodate a much larger story on its own. So the question becomes, how far do you have to go to take one of the best horror ideas of all time and turn it into this? The answer is pretty fucking far. For the sake of context, let's talk about what we're actually dealing with first, since we're going to need this information later. I'll be quick since I'm assuming if you skip the spoiler warnings, you've probably at least heard of The Thing. The game is a sequel to the 1982 movie also titled The Thing, which follows a team of researchers at an Antarctic base coming into contact with a hostile alien lifeform that has been uncovered in the snow by a Norwegian team of researchers nearby. Eventually, they learn that this creature is capable of assimilating and imitating any lifeform it comes into contact with. If even a single cell of this creature touches your body, it'll take you over cell by cell until you no longer exist. And every cell of it is capable of thinking for itself and fighting for its own survival. This is why they use flamethrowers to kill it in the movie. You can't just shoot the heart or some other organ. If you don't incinerate and destroy every single part of it down to the cellular level, it's not dead yet. It's so dangerous that, according to the numbers they have in the film, if this creature makes it to the mainland, all of mankind would be wiped out and realistically, we'd all be dead before we even knew it was happening. Once the crew learns this, paranoia sets in and the real tension of the film revolves around the loss of trust amongst the crew as they struggle to find out who is and isn't a thing while trying to survive. Despite the incredible special effects and the gore, it's a story that's held together by character interaction. It's a full team of normal, believable people living their lives coming into contact with the worst kind of cosmic horror and struggling to handle it. The revolutionary special effects are just the icing on top. At its core, it's the idea that makes it so terrifying. I'd even go so far as to say it's one of the best ideas for a horror setting ever conceived. And if handled correctly, it could make for an amazing game. But that's a big if. The game starts out with you and your team arriving by helicopter at the research station shortly after the events of the film, with the task of figuring out what happened and finding survivors from the other rescue team that preceded you. The first area sort of functions as a bit of a tutorial, so shortly after landing the game will explain the different types of squad mates you'll discover, and the fear and trust system as you're introduced to the setting. This trust system was one of the biggest draws of the game at the time, 
Essentially, each person you encounter will have a trust value that can fluctuate depending on what's happening. If they don't trust you enough, they can refuse to follow orders or even attack you if they believe that you're infected. You can gain their trust by giving them weapons or performing blood tests, inspired by the movie, on yourself to prove that you're not a thing. Members of your squad can lose it in the heat of the moment. If you're not keeping track of their sanity, they can go completely crazy and even kill themselves. Additionally, there's an infection system as you'd expect. So any squad mate that comes into contact with a thing has a chance to turn into an enemy. So between the fear of infection, managing your squad's trust, and just staying alive, you'll have a lot to manage as you play the game. Once the tutorial wraps up, you're on your own, and we'll have plenty of time to discuss what's wrong with this game, believe me. But let me just say that these first few levels are genuinely pretty good, and they're exactly what you'd expect if you bought this game thinking it was a survival horror title. You'll find yourself looking over your shoulder to see if your squad mates are acting strangely, carefully rounding every corner afraid of being infected by a sudden thing encounter, and gathering any supplies and checking on your team's sanity. And when you do find survivors, they're just as paranoid as you'd expect them to be. You'll have to earn their trust before they cooperate, and you won't ever really be sure if you can trust them back. Mystery, paranoia, isolation, it's got everything. For crying out loud, one of your first quests is to obtain a blood test kit to prove that you're not infected to one of the survivors. It's exactly what you'd want from a game like this, and there seems to have been a sincere attempt to emulate the feeling of the movie, at least in the early game. If everything was as it seemed, it would be impossible to transition from this gameplay into what we see later. To get to that point, you really have to stretch the idea of what you're working with, and it doesn't take long to start tearing apart the central idea of the game. The thing itself. Your first encounter with a thing creature sets the entire game up for failure because you kill them with handguns. We briefly covered how the thing works earlier specifically for this point. You can't kill it by shooting it. In fact, shooting it is a really bad idea because if you're just spraying its blood all over the place, you're going to wind up getting yourself or somebody else infected. It undermines the entire concept of the thing. Take the blood test for example. The entire reason the blood test works as a concept is because every single cell of the thing is autonomous. So if you expose even just its blood to danger, it will fight to preserve itself. In the movie, for example, they used a heated wire to burn the blood. And when they finally find infected blood, it literally leaps out of the petri dish to save itself. But if you're telling me that you can just shoot a thing as if it's any old creature and it can die from the injuries, we're talking about fundamentally different creatures. Either every cell is autonomous, or each thing beast is a single life form that can be shot to death. You can't really have both, although the game does try. Larger creatures still need to be burned, but they need to be shot until they reach low health first, which, not to be redundant, doesn't really make any sense. You'll also probably notice that the thing doesn't quite behave as it should. In the movie, it's cunning and patient. It could easily just run down the hallway and sneeze on everybody to get them infected, but it knows that they have flamethrowers and they could fight back. And it's smart enough to know that it doesn't have to take that kind of risk. It can just stay hidden and play the humans against each other. When trying to understand its intelligence, just keep in mind, the thing didn't just appear. It crashed onto Earth in a flying saucer, and even attempts to make a new one in the film. It's a major set piece, and you revisit it in-game, so it's not like this was retconned. But in the game, it's kind of just throwing itself at you in waves, like mindless zombies with no thought or strategy, which, like everything else so far, doesn't quite make sense. The intelligent, spacefaring, alien threat becomes a mindless zombie. I get that these are changes you'd probably have to make, since building an action experience around the actual idea of the thing is basically impossible. But that only really has me wondering why we're making an action game in the first place. And believe me, action is an understatement. Once the fighting starts, it doesn't stop. All of that tension and atmosphere the game was building in the first level gets thrown out the window never to be seen again. Even just that first encounter involves being attacked again, and again, and again. Not even 40 minutes into my playthrough, I wind up in this situation. I've opened this door, which triggers an attack of creatures that come in waves from every window in the building, and I kid you not, this goes on non-stop for almost 10 straight minutes. Before you're even allowed to develop a fear of the larger creatures, you're forced to kill several of them at a time. At certain points throughout the game, the enemies will actually respawn indefinitely, so the gauntlet won't stop until you make it past that area. For most people, by the end of the first level or so, you'll already start to consider turning the game off because it's clearly not at all what was advertised. But I was experiencing some intense denial and huffing some serious copium. I really wanted to like this game, because for me, the thing wasn't just a cool movie. As a kid, we'd occasionally visit the library as a family because yes, I had a library card. Stay jealous, YouTube. And I came across this collection of short stories by John Campbell Jr., one of which was titled Who Goes There? 
This was the original novella released in 1938 that the movies were based off of, and it's one of the first horror stories I had ever read in my entire life. I spent countless nights thinking that even the smallest risk of exposure to the mainland wouldn't be worth it, and if I was in that situation I'd have to kill my crew and wait to die in the cold. Nine year old me was gearing up to make some tough choices. And when I got older, I wound up renting John Carpenter's 1982 film without even knowing that it was based on that story. I still remember how crazy it was for me to be watching the movie and slowly realizing, oh, wait a minute, holy shit, I know this story. Suddenly, this 70 year old story from my childhood was on my screen as one of the craziest films I had ever seen. But I also loved it for another reason, and I promise this is relevant for the review, so just bear with me for a second. But I've got OCD, and when I was younger I really struggled with what's known as contamination OCD which as the name implies involves an irrational fear of germs and contamination. I would literally wash my hands so much they'd bleed sometimes, and I never really knew how to explain this weird obsession I had to other people. And then suddenly, the thing re-enters my life. An alien life form where contamination from a single bad particle could end all life on this earth. It was like seeing my irrational obsession made real. Nowadays I manage my OCD much better and I assure you my hands are quite moisturized. But the concept of the thing resonated with me on a level that I'd say was much deeper than the average person. In hindsight, might not have been the best movie to watch at that time in my life. But to get to the point, for me the thing wasn't just a movie, it was a story and a concept that had been with me since I was a kid. When I was finally able to play this game for the sake of the review, and as a huge fan of survival horror I really, really wanted to like this. It should have been everything I loved packed into a single experience. But ironically, the same reason the concept of the thing resonated with me all those years ago is why this game kind of didn't. And by kind of, I mean really didn't. It's pretty well understood that overexposure to a horror stimuli will lessen the effect. The first jump scare in a movie might get you, for example, but if the entire movie is jump scares, it'll stop being effective. It's a pretty basic concept. In this setting, you're expected to be worried about whether or not your teammates have become infected. And that type of fear would work if exposure was rare or largely avoidable. But this game rubs constant exposure in your face. Sometimes literally. Guys, uh, you guys think I'm infected yet? Let's call it a hunch. You never get to wonder if you got exposed. You and your team will be exposed over and over and over again. We mentioned OCD earlier, because this is where it's relevant. Treatment of contamination OCD involves two things. CBT, which stands for cock and ball uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, and ERP, which stands for Erotic Role... Uh, exposure and Response Prevention, excuse me. <laughs> what are the odds with these acronyms? To get to the point, getting somebody over a fear of contamination means repeatedly exposing them to a distressing stimuli, like a public doorknob, and then not letting them wash their hands. Eventually, with enough exposure, your brain realizes that shaking somebody's hand doesn't result in the immediate death, and you'll stress about it less. Hopefully, you can see the overlaps here. The game's repeated and unavoidable exposure to contamination through non-stop combat with no treatment is literally the exact way you would get somebody over their fear of contamination. This is kind of what I was talking about when I was saying I couldn't think of a worse setting for an action-adventure game. Waves of mindless creatures and the thing don't mix. In fact, it's actually worse than that because they actively sabotage each other. So now you're probably wondering, if exposure is unavoidable, then how does the infection system actually work? I'm glad you asked, because as it turns out, a much advertised feature of the game was the idea that anybody who came into contact with a thing had a chance to become a thing themselves. But the main character obviously can't be infected or the game would be over, and you'll learn later that this is because his cells are genetically resistant to being assimilated. <sighs> We'll, uh, we'll get to that later, okay? One thing at a time, people. But your teammates, however, transform into things on occasion. But if you go through the trouble of actually using the extremely rare blood test kits on your team to see if they're infected, you'll find that on more than one occasion you'll confirm your teammate is human only for them to turn into a thing literally seconds later. So as it turns out, many of the transformations are scripted and largely out of your control. To play devil's advocate for just a second, scripted events aren't necessarily the end of the world. I think it's easy to forget sometimes just how much of game design is sleight of hand. Skyboxes and distant terrain convincing you a game world is larger than it is, AI routines designed to give the illusion of convincing, bustling communities, as long as you don't look too closely anyways. Uh, for a more ridiculous example, you can look at Fallout 3's Broken Steel DLC, where the presidential metro is actually a piece of gear being worn by an NPC that runs under the map to give the illusion of a working railway. I have no idea why they had to do it this way, and no, I'm not kidding. 
At the end of the day, as long as the player believes the illusion, it doesn't really matter what's happening under the hood, so to speak. And if handled correctly, having transformations occur at scripted moments that are intentionally built up could force the player to making really difficult and interesting decisions without all the hassle of a real infection system. But that's just it, though. You'd think if the transformations were scripted, they'd have the control they needed to make it impactful, but it never is. And it's due to the same fundamental misunderstanding and misuse of the setting that we're seeing all over this game. And to fully explain that point, we need to take a bit of a detour. From a horror perspective, every gameplay mechanic you add is another angle you can use to attack the player. Give them guns and weapons, sure, but then limit their ammo before tough fights. Now suddenly that source of empowerment is a source of stress. Even the newer wave of horror games that give the player no weapon are really just an inversion of this, in that you'd expect to be given some means for self-defense in a horror game, only to be given none. So in that way I'd say it's a design choice that continues the cultural conversation in horror design, rather than opposing it. Essentially, every game that is made challenges the developers to experiment with finding new ways to add discomfort. Whether that means giving you something and then taking it away in the same game, or taking away something you'd expect to be given in the context of other games, the logic is consistent. Giving the player comfort so that you can take it away later. It's textbook horror design. But one source of comfort that developers don't often experiment with is companions, for obvious reasons. It's a commonly accepted fact that being alone will be scarier than being with a group, and getting around this issue is tough since building believable situations where you would have companions in the first place, and finding good ways to remove them isn't exactly easy. That's not to say that no horror games ever give you companions, but if you had to measure out how many horror games make you play completely alone, versus all of the horror games that give you persistent allies not counting escort missions, I'd be surprised if it was anything less drastic than a thousand to one split. The simple fact is it's just so much easier to make a horror game that revolves around a lonely protagonist. But that's what makes the concept of the thing so useful. It not only gives you the means to invert that source of comfort, but it does so in a way that is natural for the setting. The ending of the movie captures the spirit of what I mean perfectly. It's just after the blood test scene. The thing has cut the generator and all of the power is out across the station, meaning all of the people we've just confirmed as human are basically doomed. They're gonna freeze to death. But they decide if they're gonna die, they're taking the thing with it, and they take what's left of the dynamite and start blasting out the entire base. Maybe we'll just warm things up a little around here. At this point, the crew and the audience have been through a roller coaster of emotions, but here, even though the situation is basically hopeless, in its context, it still feels like a triumphant moment. You're pretty damn sure these guys are all human, and they're taking the fight to the thing, they're blowing shit up left and right, and for a moment, it almost feels like they're on top of the situation. But only for a moment. If you search on YouTube for the best scene in the thing, you'll probably get a lot of really great results. The blood test, maybe a transformation or two, the imitation scene. And it says a lot about this movie that it has so many memorable moments. Those are all great answers. But if I had to try to pick a favorite, what comes after all that dynamite is a scene that sticks with me more than any other. It's when McCready is laying explosives alone. The tension is immense, and just as McCready is ready to prime the detonator, he calls out to his last surviving friends. Your last bit of comfort as a viewer. How's it coming in there? I said, how's it? Silence. Just as you think they're on top of it, your heart sinks and you're alone again. What a fucking phenomenal scene, by the way. Holy shit. <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> oh my god. If your heart doesn't sink the minute he looks down that hallway, I'm telling you, dude. This, if this movie is not in your top ten, we can't even be friends. That's fucking nuts. Uh, you guys see the uh, the new movie where they try to pull that... Oh, like, zoinks. I think it's right behind me, Scoob. Nah, dude. McCready fucking... Wah -wah! The hood's off. This is a man who's in danger, and he knows it. It's so fucking good. <laughs> I love this movie, man. And it's like, the thing attacks him, and it's like, why does it attack him? It has to. It's defending itself. It makes sense. It's like, it's it's two plus two. Like, imagine. Imagine they never caught it when it was transforming in the first place. This whole film wouldn't even happen. All of it, it adds up. It's perfect. This is perfect. This is beautiful filmmaking, by the way. Beautiful filmmaking. It's so fucking good. <clears throat> let's uh, let's get back on track. Uh, McCready successfully sets off the explosives, hopefully destroying the thing, and we breathe a sigh of relief for the first time in maybe 30 minutes, only to turn around and see this. This right here, this moment, this is the moment the entire film was building up to. When Child steps into frame, it's the perfect synthesis of everything this movie was trying to accomplish up to this point. It's the total inversion of the companion effect. In any other horror setting, this would be a relief. Oh, thank God, a friendly face. Somebody else survived. But Childs asked him if he killed the thing, and the first thing McCready says is, where were you? 
After all the highs and lows and the paranoia, after everything you've seen, you genuinely don't know whether to be relieved or afraid. It's the difference between knowing earlier in the film that, oh, well, you don't know who to trust, and understanding it on a fundamental level at the end. After watching and experiencing the entire film, your heart sinks the minute you see Childs enter the frame. It's the perfect realization of that paranoid idea, and the movie is smart enough to leave that question unanswered. McCready and Childs both decide they're too tired to fight even if they had to, and they have a drink while they wait to freeze to death. The credits roll shortly afterwards. And for the record, leaving the ending open is necessary, not because it's fun to speculate, but because that situation, two battered and exhausted survivors, unable to trust each other at the end of it all, the bleakness of it, the fullness of that implication, that is the perfect end state for this situation. It's beautiful filmmaking, and it really shows you the full potential of what the setting has to offer. And yes, I know, the game thinks it's a great idea to not leave that ending open. We will get to that when we collectively lose our minds over how fucking dumb the story is. But let's bring it back home. The reason the transformations work in the movie is because the audience is made aware of the reality of that threat on a primal level. Yeah, McCready and the others are put into immediate physical danger by the thing, but that's not why it works. It's the implication, it's everything else. It's seeing your friends turn into monsters, it's being forced into impossible decisions. It's coming face to face with what is in all actuality a completely unbeatable foe with nobody to help you, and even if you could reach help, it would probably only make things worse. But as I said before, this game misuses the transformation in the same way it misuses everything else. It's just another meaningless source of mundane danger. It's not the culmination of any built up tension, there's no question or fear, no paranoia. Your team just spontaneously transforms to give you something to shoot at, and it feels about as shallow as it sounds. With so many of the transformations being scripted, they should have been able to guarantee some kind of impact, or at the very least, they could guarantee you had some kind of connection to your team before ripping them away from you. But instead, it seems like the game goes so far out of its way to make you not care about the characters, it's almost laughable. None of the characters you meet outside of the first level are even given a personality, much less any story significance. There's almost no dialogue, they say very little if anything, and most of them don't even have any reason to help you. They're just random people that you encounter, recruit, and then abandon. They're one-dimensional characters that exist to either fix a fuse box or heal you before going to the next level, where they will no doubt find some way to either disappear or die. So even if the infection mechanic worked as advertised, transformations don't carry the weight that they should. You're not losing a team member that you grew to trust and care about over the course of the game, you're losing a nobody what's his name that you only met five minutes ago. And believe me, I mean it when I say the characters just disappear. Sometimes they'll transform just to get rid of them at a scripted moment, but other times you'll walk through a vent and your team just won't go with you. Or you'll get into an elevator to escape an explosion and your team won't get in with you. Or you'll get into a boss fight and your team won't go in with you. It happens a lot. And in case you're wondering, no, your team doesn't trust you any less after locking you into a room with a gigantic thing beast, even though they probably should. When you stack this game up to the movie or even just the short story, it's a night and day difference. An idea that could have made for one of the most incredible gaming experiences is sidelined in favor of more explosions. The perfect example being here when I'm with this guy whose name I can't remember, which is part of the problem, and all I do is walk through a door. Now my teammate disappears for no reason, and the entire building is suddenly on fire for no reason. That whole area back there is a dead end by the way, so there's no reason why he wouldn't come with me to escape the burning building. And in case you're wondering, I have no idea why the building is exploding. It's literally just get this thing shit out of here so that we can get back to the action, followed by lots of explosions, which is weird since it's supposed to be a game about the thing. The actual transformations are also handled pretty poorly. The game makes a big point about stressing how rare blood tests are, and you'd think you'd get a chance to maybe use a couple as they were intended first. But infected teammates tend to transform whenever they feel like it, whether you test them or not. Most of the time, if I thought somebody was infected, I could just nudge them a little bit and they'd transform on their own without a test required. Even the timing of the scripted transformations has me a little bit confused. In the beginning, you'll have two teammates that are scripted to transform after you prove yourself to Pierce. If they were both infected, why didn't they turn on me when I was alone in the snow being attacked by other thing creatures? Why would they wait until they have no backup and are facing two flamethrowers? Almost every scripted transformation happens in this way. They're not transforming because it makes sense, but because the developers needed to get rid of your teammates before the next level and couldn't think of a better way to do it. At least until they give up on trying at all and your teammates just cease to exist between levels. Additionally, whenever an NPC transforms, they drop their items and you can just pick them back up, I guess. They don't use the guns to shoot you first, so there's no risk in giving them as many supplies as you like. Just, uh, kill your co-worker, <laughs> burned him to death and took his stuff. Does that, uh, that bother you guys? Uh, evidently not very close. 
a bunch of fucking psychopaths in this place. So basically, most transformations carry no weight, pose no danger, and risk no gear loss, and have no impact on your surviving team. Like I said, the whole mechanic is extremely underutilized, if you can even say it was utilized at all. As long as we're talking about managing our squads, we should talk about the fear and trust system, which featured front and center in all of the advertising. It's one of the main features that everybody uses to argue that this game is a hidden gem and deserves a remake. At this point, I think you get the idea. If the game says that it has a big revolutionary system posted on the box, no such system exists in the game, or if it does, it's not used very much. In an interview that I found after intense research, meaning I skimmed the Wikipedia article on this game, William Natham said, We had to scale it back. We tried to mimic human behavior, but at the end of the day, it didn't matter too much how you treated your teammates, which sums it up pretty nicely, actually. Outside of that first level, you won't have to earn the trust of really any NPCs that you meet. The only time an NPC ever turned on me was because I purposely shot him in the head repeatedly just to see what he was going to do. And beyond that situation, managing trust levels is either completely unnecessary or extremely easy. For starters, guns, ammo, and health kits are never scarce. There wasn't a single time in the entire game where I was low on supplies, ever. So if I came across a new NPC and had to earn their trust, I just threw supplies at them. I had duplicates of every gun and plenty of ammo to spare, and I knew that even if they transformed, they were just going to drop their stuff anyways. There was no risk involved. This is another situation where the insistence on making this an action game clashes with what the setting was actually made for. In real survival horror games, or scenarios, the developers can experiment with giving you a limited supply of items because enemy placement is thoughtful, and there's also usually a melee option. If you run out of ammo in Silent Hill, for example, it's feasible that you could continue to make progress using a lead pipe for a weapon until you come across more supplies. This way, developers can restrict your ammo as a source of stress because there's always a safety net of the melee option. In this game, it never stops throwing enemies at you, and because of the nature of the thing, melee weapons wouldn't make any sense, so there's no ammo-free option. You couldn't just give a crowbar to your teammate and have him bludgeon a thing beast to death without becoming infected, of course. Or at least you shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, this game seems to play pretty fast and loose with the rules, but whatever. Essentially, if you run out of ammo in the thing, the game is over. So not only does the game have to throw near infinite ammo at you at nearly every checkpoint and throughout every level to mash the infinite enemies, but the later human enemies will drop ammo on death. So even if the game did throw an NPC at you that has zero trust in you whatsoever, you can just hand him enough weapons and ammo to arm a small nation without even having to think about it. And not only is using supplies to earn trust extremely easy, it's also extremely difficult to lose trust. You can take weapons away from an NPC, which will hurt their trust, but there's no reason why you would ever actually do that. They also don't lose trust in you when you do things that should shake their trust. In one level, for example, there's a medic who I realized was scripted to transform later on after dying to something stupid. So when I restarted the level, I just shot him dead before he could turn. Of course, I knew he would become infected later because I had seen the future, but you'd think that if I randomly shot a teammate in the head without good reason, who turned out to be completely human, my teammates would probably start asking questions, right? But they don't react at all, and their trust in me doesn't even flinch. Like the other novel game mechanics at play, the trust system was sidelined and sacrificed in order to make room for more action. In fact, the game is so action-focused that by the end of the game, I found myself dropping my blood test kits and adrenaline shots, the two crucial items for managing your party's trust, to make room for more grenades, because that's just the kind of game this game is. You're not managing your team, your supplies, or any infections, it's just an action game from start to finish and everything else is just window dressing. So the thing doesn't behave or operate like the thing. There's no real fear of infection or even a working infection system, and you won't have to worry about the state of your teammates. And when you think about it, that's pretty much every reason to even have a game about the thing in the first place. What do you actually have left at this point? Well, if you noticed, we've avoided talking directly about the combat and the story so far, and that's because if we started there, this video would have been too easy. I'd explain the story, and you'd immediately say, ah, so this game's dog shit. And I really wanted to take my time dissecting why each other part of it was so terrible first. But as you can imagine, the story and the action that were so important that it was worth sacrificing everything else to achieve, it's pretty terrible. You ready? Brace for it, and don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. There's a story. Could you imagine though? So you know how in the film the Norwegian research team uncover this little creature in the ice, only to quickly be overrun by it? You know how their research station, the one that's completely destroyed by the time the Americans go poking around? Well, you're, and listen, you're never gonna believe this. This is so good. 
It was actually a front to hide a secret underwater testing laboratory hidden underneath it, where an evil corporation called Gen Inc. isolated a form of the thing they now call the Cloud Virus, and were planning on turning it into a biological weapon before- It's a generic zombie outbreak story. Uh, they had one of the coolest ideas for a horror setting, and they turned it into a generic zombie story. This is why the thing throws itself at you like a big dumb meat sack and dies to bullets. It's just zombies, no matter what the game says. Whitley, your commanding officer, was in on it from the start, and injects himself with a specific strain of the virus in an attempt to cure his cancer. It's never explained why he thought it could do that, but now he plans to spread the virus to the whole world using cargo planes for some reason, but you take him down with the help of a helicopter pilot who shows up just in the nick of time. Excellent timing there, pilot. Early retirement from Gen Inc. <laughs> no, not exactly. On my way back from an extended Arctic vacation. Uh-huh. So what's your name, smartass? McCready. Fuck off. R.J. McCready. U.S. Outpost North 31. If you, like me, have at least a room temperature IQ, you probably have some questions. Let's start from the beginning. Whitley was in on it from the start. You can hear him laughing in the original Norwegian footage. <laughs> and he's in command of both teams that were sent to investigate the two research facilities in the beginning of the game. What are we doing here exactly? Did he have us come here just to die for his amusement? This is Antarctica, remember. It's not like things needed to be covered up. Nobody's gonna randomly stumble onto these two research bases. You need a permit and specific travel insurance to even approach Antarctica. And if all he wanted to do is infect the mainland, all he had to do was hop on a plane and go do that. Why does he need cargo planes full of cloud virus strains to do it? And if all he needs to do is infect the mainland, why is he even trying to cover up the facilities? In the time it took us to do everything else in the game, he could have flown to Argentina and started slapping doorknobs. It's not like he needed to get large cargo plane quantities of the virus first, it's self-replicating. That's kind of the whole point. And why does he want to infect the mainland again? Allegedly the virus can be controlled by whatever they did in the lab, at least that's what he says, but I'm assuming if his goal is to infect everyone it isn't controlled and it's just a thing, but then why is he telling us any of this? The same thing creature that was willing to cut the power and freeze for another 100,000 years to avoid the risk in the movie is suddenly cackling off his evil plan to us in detail here. And furthermore, why is he ordering Blake, the literal one person on the planet that is immune to assimilation, and no, that's never really explained either, so it's whatever, to investigate these facilities for no reason? The one person on the planet that could potentially fight him with no risk of infection, and he's got him all over the facility doing... I don't know, nobody seems to know. Why doesn't he kill Blake when he has the chance? He shoots Blake with a tranquilizer at one point. Why? What are we doing here? And who are all of these people that we encounter in the facility, and why are they helping us? Why are the other people in the facility hostile to them? I kept encountering random engineers and medics that were apparently being shot at by the special ops guys before I even got there for no reason. And you'd think if you helped them, they'd stick around, but they will ditch you every time you leave a level or walk through a door, so apparently they help you just for shits before going back to their job, maybe? or something? And why did that one guy try to kill me with poison gas? Is he really trying to brown nose his way into a promotion when everybody else has already been murdered by the thing? And before even all that, how do you even build a facility to control the thing? With a traditional zombie virus, I could see it, since even if the zombies are strong, they still have to bite you for you to get infected, right? So you could, you could feasibly avoid that and maybe capture some zombies for testing. But all you have to do to be infected by the thing is touch it. How could you possibly? Discover this creature, figure out what it is and what it does, develop containment procedures and build a facility to successfully hold it and test on it, only to have it still escape and run amok in less than that time. H how did any of this happen? And if there was a secret underwater facility for studying the thing built under the Norwegian base, why was the original ice block containing the thing housed above the ground in a rickety wooden structure? Uh, hold on actually, what is this timeline? We arrived shortly after the American base gets overrun. Shortly enough that Childs has died of exposure, but McCready hasn't. And he also just procures a helicopter. I don't know where that came from or why he's alive. It, it's, none of this is explained. Which only gives us maybe a time frame of two days. 
Never mind that people weren't supposed to check on the American facility till spring, but that means that within literally a couple days, Gen Inc. builds multiple gigantic testing facilities, contains, and then loses control of the thing in that time? Or were the research facilities already there, and if so, why was the thing being kept at the Norwegian base in the first place? Uh, that actually doesn't work either. I mean, it, the Norwegians pulled it out of the ice, so it had to escape before anyone could study it. Realistically, right? And it's that thing that hits the Americans. How do you even... How do you squeeze Gen Inc. into this timeline? Realistically, how do, how do you even make sense of this? And why did Whitley inject the biological weapon into his body, expecting it to cure his cancer? And, and wait a minute, if he didn't he didn't even inject himself until later on in the story, was he just planning to the whole time, or was what does the rest of the story even have to do with this? And hold on, let's let's just play devil's advocate for a second, because he says he's infected, but it cured his cancer and it's under control. What are we fighting him for at this point? He could genuinely be curing all illnesses on the planet while also giving people superpowers. Is Blake a shill for Big Pharma? You can't kill cancer, Whitley! Think of the medical companies, the profit margins! And if we're retconning the thing into a virus, then why did they keep the UFOs in the game as major set pieces? The final boss fight happens literally on top of the original UFO. Doesn't that kind of run directly contrary to what they're trying to do with the thing by turning it into a mindless virus? I mean, it's either a virus or capable of space travel. I, it, 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 this is pure nonsense. Doesn't prove a thing. I genuinely do not have any answers for you. I went back and read the wiki on this, and I took the time to read all the notes scattered throughout the game. They do not clear anything up. If anything, they kind of confuse the matter, because I was under the impression that the cloud virus was something they developed to control the thing, but sometimes the thing is referred to as the cloud virus, and then Whitley apparently takes a specific strain of the thing called the cloud virus B4, which only muddies it further, and the wiki just calls it a virus. Reading the other PC entries won't help either. At best, you get these ridiculous diary entries like this one, talking about how they found big holes in the vents, and they say, well, guess an animal got in. Mind you, this is Antarctica. There's, there ain't no fucking animals down there. And I feel like if you worked at a facility that monitored the thing of all creatures, and you started to find ominous holes left in your infrastructure by as of yet unidentified creatures, you'd probably be a bit more worried than these guys were. Dear Diary, animals are in the vents, I guess, but it's probably nothing. Okay, now I click save document and I'm off to lunch. And why are they using an entire PC to leave a single note? That's extremely wasteful. But like I said, that's that's really all there is to say on the story. There's no way to make sense of it. It's crazy, it's dumb, and it really wasn't worth sacrificing the entire core identity of the thing to achieve. By the end of the game, I was just desperate for an explanation of how it even got this bad. So I looked into it, and in an interview with GameSpot, Universal Interactive producer Peter Wanat said, The gameplay is more action horror. What we wanted to do was get away from the slow, plotting for hours style of gameplay, which made us more likely to fall asleep than wet our pants from fear. So we made the shooting aspects more frenzied in order to really wake the player up. So when we do slow the pace back down, your sense that any minute it could get hairy again really starts to mess with you. Okay, so this quote is filled with weird takes. This game came out in 2002, so by this time the survival horror genre already had a number of major hitters on the scene. We're talking multiple Resident Evil titles, Silent Hill 1 and Silent Hill 2, which many people consider to be one of the best survival horror games made ever. Clive Barker's Undying, Dino Crisis, Eternal Darkness, the Clock Tower series, and countless more. By all accounts, the genre is booming. If you can look at that spread of games and tell me that it just puts you to sleep, maybe survival horror just isn't for you. But to then follow that up by describing shooting sections in a video game as messing with you, because it can be frantic and then equate that experience to horror, it kind of feels like if you sat the average dude bro down and asked them, when was the last time you were scared or unsettled in a video game? If a cosmic entity ever tried to crash land on Earth and assimilate my cells, I'd kick its ass. This whole game feels like it was made by someone like this, and it really explains how the game wound up the way it did. And so, with such a heavy action focus moving forward, how is that action anyways? It's terrible, thanks for asking. We saved it for the very last on purpose. You can probably tell just from the footage you've seen that the camera is very floaty and difficult to control. Moving the mouse even slightly will whip your camera around, which is twice as stupid once you notice that the game has auto-aim. So it's not like you'd need to be able to quickly and precisely adjust the reticle or anything. You just look in the direction of the enemy and shoot. It's like a regular action game, but this time with more motion sickness. The camera also adjusts itself based on where the enemies are, so you're constantly having the camera shift and move around on its own. 
If you come across an enemy that's above you like a turret, Blake will react as though he was just accused of not being turtly enough for the turtle club, and retracts his head into his shoulders, refusing to look down until you leave the area or break the turret. When you're trying to look for keys and other items on the ground, having your head stuck like this is a serious problem. On just one level alone, I spent almost an hour running around wondering what I was missing to progress, only to find a key on a body that I had thoroughly inspected a hundred times. The game requires almost pixel perfect positioning to get the prompt to take most items, and you can't interact with items while in first person mode either. Why? The auto-aim itself is also terrible. It's not uncommon for a single small scuttler to take sometimes 50 bullets to kill because your aim is artificially terrible. You're a lot more likely to shoot everything around what you're aiming at instead. You can aim manually by switching into first person, but then you can't move, and since you're constantly being swarmed with enemies, sitting still for a second can get you killed. You might think that you can avoid being swarmed with good positioning, but this game will gracelessly spawn waves of enemies right in front of your eyes. You will visually confirm that an area is empty, and then cross over an obvious trigger point and suddenly enemies just appear. It was the worst with the soldier placements at the end of the game. You could close the door behind you, and in a completely enclosed space, soldiers would just materialize out of thin air. And as you may have noticed, for a game where you often just explode and die at random, there's no way to load your save after dying. You either restart the level and revert to well before your last save, or exit to the main menu and load your save from there. This is one of those basic levels of polish that, if missing, should be reason enough for you to drop a game completely. It's like seeing a vegetarian chef at a barbecue or a bald hairstylist. You don't need any extra information, you can just leave. Making things worse, the hit registration is terrible, as bullets and flames will frequently pass right through enemies without dealing any damage. Compounding that, the blowtorch and the flamethrower are two of the clunkiest weapons in the game, which is weird considering how necessary they are given the setting. They don't have the same level of auto-aim as the other weapons, instead they aim directly at your feet. You will light yourself on fire before you light anything else on fire. I'm not kidding when I say that the flame extends maybe two feet out from where you're standing. This means that you have to run directly into the arms of a thin creature if you want to light it on fire, and there's a solid chance you'll light yourself on fire at the same time. You can go into first person to shoot directly in front of you, but the range is miserably short, so you'll still wind up running into the thing, shooting your pitiful flame, and getting hit at the same time. And yes, even in first person, the flames will frequently fail to register. So you'll have to attempt this multiple times if you want to burn anything, and later thin creatures will need to be burned multiple times. I shouldn't have to explain to you how incredibly annoying this all becomes by the end of it. Oh, and just a heads up, when you do actually burn something, get ready for some gnarly visual looks. The entire stage will turn bright green and blue. I thought this might be because I was on PC, but apparently this also happens on Xbox and PS2, so that's kind of just how it is. I got these visual errors even in the final boss fight, and let me just say, after the absolute misery that was playing this game from start to finish, watching the final boss T-pose and glow strange colors was a borderline spiritual experience. The bugs aren't just visual though, they can be game-breaking. At one point you need to fight through a hallway of these tentacled creatures, but mine bugged out and couldn't be killed and wouldn't let me pass. I had to restart from the beginning of the level to proceed. I also had this weird occasional bug where my guns just wouldn't fire. If I clicked they wouldn't fire and then if I held the mouse down they would, sometimes. But sometimes it was the reverse and other times whether I clicked or held they just wouldn't shoot so I'd run into an enemy's face and do nothing at all. And it's not just gameplay and visual bugs, there's audio bugs too. In the hangars and in certain underground levels, the audio will cut out completely, and no audio plays when you enter a boss room. What's going on here? And it's weird that there's so many audio bugs when the game barely has any audio to begin with. There's, there's no music. And if this was a survival horror game, it might have added the atmosphere, but it's complete silence coupled with non-stop shooting and the exact same thing screech over a trillion times. It's the audio equivalent of eating an unflavored nutrient block. What you will get is the occasional two second musical sting which feels like 50 minutes into a level of non-stop action the developers thought, oh wait, this is supposed to be a horror game, and just randomly slap some stings in there to compensate, usually when you encounter the exact same thing creatures you've seen for the entire game. Or the other time where they were like, oh wait, this is supposed to be about the thing, and they threw the most half-assed thing related drama they could at you completely out of the blue, 
and it falls flat because you have no idea who either of these guys are, and two seconds after you save the human one, he tries to kill you with poison gas of all things. By this point in the video, I know that you know that this game treats the thing like a complete afterthought between explosions. I, I just thought that this one situation in particular was such a perfect snapshot of the game. It's lazy movie fan service into pure nonsense followed by your team disappears and we're back to explosions. Speaking of, the explosive red barrel trope achieved something of a meme status back in the day with action games being littered with thousands of these random explosive red barrels. At the very least here, in the thing, you could rationalize there being explosive and flammable material around given that you'd need that to control an outbreak of the thing. But even in the research facilities where they weren't trying to contain the thing and study it, there's explosive barrels all over the place. Enemy black ops will use them as cover, seemingly unfazed by the risk, and the thing creatures will crawl all over them and just wait for death. I guess with this many fire hazards, it's no wonder the entire facility seems to be exploding around the clock. Even Whitley in the final boss fight decides to just sit in the middle of multiple piles of explosive barrels that magically pour fire onto him when shot. Why? Was he set up by Big Pharma? The insurance companies, Whitley. Think of the insurance companies. Honestly, I could keep going, and if you can believe it, there's a lot we didn't even cover in this video. And while it's definitely one of the worst games I think I've ever played, down to the gameplay, the direction, the lore, the story, the sound design, the total lack of polish, I really shouldn't have expected any better. It's a licensed movie game after all, and those are always terrible. Universal Interactive only made the game in the first place because they were leafing through their IPs and figured they could make some money off it. And the developers came right out and said they thought most horror games were boring and cited Grand Theft Auto as a major influence for this game, which is a bit of a weird one. The only reason I thought it would be any different is because it does a great job of convincing you otherwise. It's so prominently featured gameplay mechanics that would have been genuinely amazing to experience. Certain reviewers on YouTube demanded a remaster, and even John Carpenter himself said he considers it to be the canon sequel to the movie and made a cameo in the game. Which I can only imagine he didn't have access to the full story, or maybe he's just too old to understand video games, because I can't fucking imagine how the same guy who made the best horror film of all time looked at this project that retconned all of the important stuff from the movie and was like, yeah, no, this is it. That's the spice. Right there. <sighs> but I digress. There's a bit of a trend when discussing this game as of late to consider it something of a hidden gem, and it's frequently asked why this game faded into obscurity so quickly despite being received so well at the time. But I would argue that even at the time, I think the target demographic for this game actually had it pretty well figured out. While I was sitting on the Wikipedia frothing at the mouth, trying to piece together the absolute mess of a story compared to my notes, I saw this commentary for Eurogamer's Kristen Reed at the time of the release. He said in regards to the fear trust system, it is nowhere near as much of a neat gameplay innovation as the hype had some people believe. Mm, yeah, sounds right to me. As a squad based game, it would work far better if you ever had to care a great deal for anyone's survival. As it is, most of the team seems to split off once a level's over, or turn into aliens at predetermined moments during it. So you're left merely using each NPC as a means of progression. Yeah, it uh, sounds pretty accurate actually. He was also critical of the graphics, which he argued look old school, with bad texturing, uninteresting particle effects, and vanilla architecture. Can't argue with that. He concluded, if you can pick up the thing cheap, you won't be too disappointed. It's by no means a bad game. All right, you're uh, starting to lose me here, Kristen. Keep it on script. But it's all the more disappointing thanks to the fact that it could and should have been brilliant. And really, that last line says it all. There's no mystery here. The game received decent success on launch because it was a painfully generic over-the-shoulder shooter that did everything in its power to sideline what would have made it unique. And like every game that appeals to a wider audience, it failed to impress the core audience that actually mattered. So once it came and went, that was it. It could and should have been brilliant. But it wasn't. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. I genuinely thought this was going to be a cool hidden gem game to bring to the channel. Hopefully it was still enjoyable.